happen. I'll just check this is working. Good, we got sound, fantastic. Um, so we're going to uh, be reading um, today the wedding at Cana of Galilee, um, which is in John 2, verses 1 to 11. So I'll probably just read that uh, through for us, and you can follow on in your Bibles if you want. Um, on the third day, there was a wedding celebration in the village of Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples were also invited to the celebration. The wine supply ran out during the festivities, so Jesus' mother told him, they have no more wine. Dear woman, your concerns and mine are not the same, Jesus replied. My time has not yet come. But his mother told the servants, do whatever he tells you. Standing nearby were six stone water jars used for Jewish ceremonial washing, and each could hold 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus told the servants, fill the jars with water. When the jars had been filled, he said, now dip some out and take it to the master of ceremonies. So the servants followed his instructions. When the master of ceremonies tasted the water that was now wine, not knowing where it had come from, though of course the servants knew, he called the bridegroom over. A host always serves the best wine first, he said. Then when everyone's had a lot to drink, he brings out the less expensive wine. But you, have kept the best until now. This miraculous sign at Cana in Gal Galilee was the first time Jesus revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. So what a fantastic story. <laughs> the miraculous story of the wedding at Cana is about wine the very best wine, and, and I'm so excited by this topic. <laughs> um, I've not been to Cana in Galilee, but if I did, I would be sure to buy a bottle of um, dry red Cana wedding wine. And I think if I push this, does that work? Yes! It's not, okay. Um, I'd buy a bottle of this dry red Cana of Galilee wedding wine. So there was obviously still some left over. Um, <laughs> uh, sadly, it's not available here. Um, but I did go out to the Great Grog Shop in, uh, in Edinburgh to get a bottle to celebrate later on with Heather. When Glenn asked me to preach on this uh, passage, I was really happy. And three points jumped out uh, straight away. Um, First, Jesus blesses weddings. I think that's a fantastic thing. We're just recently married. Um, second, uh, external washing for purification. All that uh, Jewish ceremonial washing is out. We can be externally grubby. Um, and, and third, God is not teetotal. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> um, that's not to say that some of us don't need to refrain. Um, we all seem to get addicted to something. And um, there, there's heaps in the Bible, in Proverbs, about the dangers of heavy drinking. Um, Proverbs 23 is, is, a, is a, a serious message if you need that warning. And Paul even cautions us not to drink if it will cause somebody else to stumble in Romans 14. And uh, in Titus 2, elderly women are particularly warned not to be heavy drinkers. And um, <laughs> so, so, yes, uh, my, my, my wife, Heather, w worried that I was putting that in because of her. But uh, <laughs> um, no, uh, you're not elderly. And uh, yeah, uh, but all that aside, <laughs> move on. God has given us wine to make us glad. Um, if you read in Psalm 104, the purpose of wine that God gives to us is to make us glad. So God is not teetotal. Yep, there you have it. Three points. Um, weddings, good. Ceremonial washing, out. And, and teetotal, no. Um, but as I sat and read this passage, uh, I began to feel 
that the wine bottle um, was really very much deeper. And when John wrote this book, he told us why he was writing it um, in chapter 20. And he said, the disciples saw Jesus do many other miraculous signs in addition to the one recorded, ones recorded in this book, but these are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and by believing in him, you'll have life by power of his name. So why is this sign the very first of seven in John's Gospel? Um, actually, I could only find six, but I think later on in chapter two of John's Gospel, when Jesus has cleared the market stalls in the temple, um, the Jewish leaders demanded, what are you doing? If God gave you authority to do this, show us a miraculous sign to prove it. All right, Jesus replied, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. So I think that was the seventh sign they did and he did. So these signs in John are a demonstration that Jesus is the Messiah, Son of God, but what's the significance of turning water into wine? Uh, what's so special about wine, grapes, vines, vineyards, feasts? And Glenn has asked us to illustrate these um, stories in the summer series um, through a painting. So we're going to have a look at a painting. Hmm? There we are. So this is a painting of the wedding feast by an artist called Paolo Veronese, and it's displayed in the same room of the Louvre as the Mona Lisa. Um, many people don't even know it's there because they come into the Louvre and they queue to see the Mona Lisa, and they don't see right behind it, there's this 10 meter wide uh, painting by Paolo Veronese, with 132 different portraits in it. So it's a vast thing. And what's going on here? Maybe I'll just uh, zoom in a bit. Uh, yeah, great. So you can see Jesus and Mary in the center. And, and that's a bit odd because Jesus is not the groom after all. Or is he? Um, let's see the whole thing. Um, you can see on the very far left the bride and bridegroom sitting on the table right at the left. Um, and the master of ceremonies uh, in green is walking over to uh, commend them for bringing out the best wine for last. And on the right you can see the servants pouring out the wine. But there's much more going on in this painting. Um, Behind the wine pourers is a white character, sort of rather decadently holding a glass of wine, and that was a famous, rather scandalous Venetian poet. And behind him, seated in red, is a portrait of Charles V of France, emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, defender of the Catholic faith. At the very far left on the back, on the table at the back, you can see perhaps somebody with a bobbly yellow hat. And that's a, a portrait of the Doge of Venice, the, the ruler of Venice at the time, Girolamo Piriri. So there's a lot going on in this painting. It's not just set in Galilee. And in the front, you have a bunch of musicians. Um, and yes, Paolo Veronese himself has painted a self-portrait, and that's the, the person playing a viola in white. And behind him, his friend, another painter, um, Tintoretto, and across from him in the orange is perhaps v Venice's most important painter, um, who is a Venetian artist called Titian. And so they're celebrating with Jesus in this picture, and clearly Paolo saw himself and his fellow painters as part of this scene. Jesus is doing something that's relevant to them. So what might he be doing that's relevant to them? Well, well perhaps um, if you notice that above Jesus' head, you'll see some servants carving up 
um, some meat, and there we believe carving up a lamb, wielding a knife that in the painting is directly above Jesus' head. So the symbolism is very strong. This is the Lamb of God. Um, and and he, the story is relevant for all of us. So uh, the painter has painted all of his contemporaries in the scene. And I think the disciple John, when he's writing this story in the Bible, perhaps even more strongly, is using symbolism, special phrases, to communicate meaning to us. But unlike us, the disciples and the people of the time would have studied and memorized the scriptures, the Old Testament, Torah, and Prophets. And so when John uses particular words, they, it would have immediately triggered in their head um, meaning. And, and so John is sketching a much richer picture than the, we can see at first glance from reading this story of Cana in Galilee. It's as though he's using hyperlinks when he uses certain words, and they refer, they carry meaning from Old Testament stories. And so what I'm going to try and do is, is think through um, the, these sort of terms, grapes and wine and vines and vineyards and feasts and wine presses, to see if we can enrich this story of Cana Galilee and, and give it some of the meaning that I think John would have been trying to communicate to his disciples. So hopefully this will help us um, add something to this story of um, new wine. And it's interesting, isn't it, that we have a, a Christian um, conference that's called New Wine. So this idea of wine, new wine, works in the, in the modern sense as well. So let's put our synagogue 3D glasses on, uh, our memorization of scripture, and see if there's more to celebrate than the lack of tea totalism. So if we can have the next. Uh, it's just, this is probably too small to see, but let, let me take you through four different ways in which this symbol of wine and vineyards enriches meaning. First, Jesus as the Son of God, Emmanuel, or God with us, is described as a bridegroom to his church, the bride. And so he's toasting uh, in the new creation with celebratory wine. It's always good when you read stories like John 2 to look at the context. So we're in the very early part of John's gospel, and the story comes immediately after, of course, John 1. And how does John 1 begin? John's gospel begins, in the beginning was the word. Now, what other Bible passage does that remind you of in the beginning? Genesis, exactly. So, in Genesis 1, God created the heavens and the earth. And seven times we read, and God said, God said the words, let there be light. And there was light. So, John is calling Jesus the word and equating Jesus with the Creator, God. The Word was with God, he said, and the Word was God. And in Genesis 1, we have seven creative days. W what about John 1, the first chapter of John? Well, when you look at John 1, we kick off the story with John the Baptist talking to the priests and the temple assistants. I am a voice shouting in the wilderness, clear the way for the Lord's coming. That's day one. Then in verse 29 we read, the next day John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The next day, that's day two. Then in verse 35, the following day, day three, and so on. And if you march through those days, you'll see that when we get to, to John chapter 2, and he says, on the third day was a wedding in Cana. That's the seven complete days. So there's something going on here where John is comparing the creation story with 
Jesus' arrival in the uh, town of Cana in Galilee. And what happens next in Genesis 2 is that, of course, you get uh, the story of Adam and Eve. Um, bone from bone, flesh from flesh, we read in Genesis 2. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united as one. So Genesis 2 is about creation and the story of wedding, and John kicks off his narrative with a creation story and then goes into a wedding. But the groom and the bride are not mentioned in this story in John. And, and that's a bit odd, frankly, <laughs> to have a description of a story, but we, we're not told who the groom and the bride was. Now, later on in Luke's Gospel, chapter 5, we see some people complaining to Jesus. John the Baptist's disciples fast and pray regularly, and so do the disciples of the Pharisees. Why are your disciples always eating and drinking? We can only imagine that the complainers had this sort of feast in mind, the wedding at Cana in Galilee. And what does Jesus reply? Do wedding guests fast while celebrating with the groom? Of course not. But someday the groom will be taken away from them and then they'll fast. So Jesus sees himself as a groom at the wedding. And that's rather an odd thing to say. And again, when Jesus is telling parables, such as the parable of the wedding feast, he says, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a king who prepared a great wedding feast for his son. So again, who is the son in the story for whom the king is preparing a wedding feast? Well, it's Jesus. Jesus is the groom. And how is it that the kingdom of heaven is like a wedding feast? So let's find out. In, in Revelation 19, at the end of days, we hear what sounds like the shout of a vast crowd or the crash of thunder. Praise the Lord, it says, for the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let's be glad and rejoice and let's give honor to him, for the time has come for the wedding feast of the Lamb. And his bride has prepared herself. She has been given the finest of pure white linen to wear. For the fine linen represents the good deeds of God's holy people. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the feast of the Lamb. Wow. Wow. So all of that is going on in this story of Cana of Galilee because of the symbolism John's using. We are so loved by God that he, as Jesus the groom, is about to marry us. We, the church, are about to be washed clean by Jesus' actions that are commencing in John's Gospel and be washed clean, placed in white linen as his bride. Let that sink in. We, uh, you and me, are loved so much that God has washed us clean in order to marry us. Um, that's LGBTQ++, I think. <laughs> I shouldn't put that one in. <laughs> um, so there's something very exciting going on. So, but let's look at the second way in which wine and vines and vineyards has a greater, more richer meaning. So we've made a link to the Genesis story, but what about Exodus and Numbers? Is there anything else about wine that we can remember from those stories as Moses leads Israel out of Egypt across the desert wilderness? Well, when they've got across the wilderness, um, they send out spies into the promised land. And what is it that the spies bring back? 
Does anybody remember? Grapes, exactly. When they came to the valley of Eshol in the promised land, they cut down a branch with a single cluster of grapes so large that it took two of them to carry it on the pole. Now, you might think I'm stretching this a bit far. What on earth have grapes that spies are bringing back to demonstrate the bounty of the promised land got to do with the wedding story in Cana? But let's, let's look a little bit further. How does the Bible describe the promised land? Let's read from Isaiah chapter 5. Now, I will sing for the one I love, it says, a song about his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a rich and fertile hill. He plowed the land, he cleared its stones, and planted it with the best vines. In the middle, he built a watchtower and carved a wine press in the nearby rocks. And then he waited for a harvest of sweet grapes. But the grapes that grew were bitter, says Isaiah. God in the prophets, the many prophets, describes Israel as a vine or a vineyard whose fruit and wine were meant to be the blessings for the other nations, supposed to be a blessing of good things. But the vine or vineyard is a symbol of what Israel was meant to be. Let's look at another passage just to show that I'm not making it up. If we look at um, Psalm 80, we read... You brought us from Egypt like a grapevine. You drove away the pagan nations and transplanted us into your land. You cleared the ground for us, and we took root and filled the land. But now, why have you broken down our walls, so that all that pass by may steal our fruit? Come back, we beg you, O God of heaven's armies. Look down from heaven and see our plight. Take care of this grapevine that you yourself have planted. So Jesus himself clearly saw himself as the heir to the Israelite vineyard in the promised land. And if you look at something like the parable of the vineyard in Matthew 21, the tenant farmers are going to kill the son of the vineyard owner. And so we don't have time to read it in detail here, but Jesus sees himself as the vineyard's owner's son. And Israel is the promised land. It's even more clear in John 15 where Jesus says, I am the true grapevine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so that they could produce even more. Remain in me and I will remain in you, for a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine. You cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. So here in Cana of Galilee sits Jesus, Jesus Christ, ushering in the land of promise. He is the true vine. And he's turning water into wine to symbolize how the promised land should have been, a wine of joyful celebration, of blessing to the nations. And if we remain in him, we can be fruitful, not with bitter grapes, but with something that is for celebration. So that's the second way in which these stories about wine are drawing on the Old Testament stories to enrich our understanding. Thirdly, we've got Jesus as Savior, the Messiah. Um, Back in Genesis, in Egypt, before the Exodus, if you remember the story, Jacob had joined his sons under Joseph, who was second in command uh, under the Pharaoh. And Jacob is a very old man at this point, and so he's going to bless the 12 sons before he dies. Now, we know that Judah, his son Judah, was ultimately going to be the the lineage of David, who was promised a never-ending kingdom, and that from that lineage was going to come Jesus, the Messiah. 
And, and I want you just to listen to what Jacob said about Judah, about his son Judah, 3,713 years ago, because it's, it's amazing. Judah, my son, is a young lion that has finished eating its prey. Like a lion, he crouches and lies down. Like a lioness, who dares to rouse him? The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from his descendants, until the coming of the one to whom it belongs, the one whom all nations will honor. He ties his foal to a grapevine, the colt of his donkey to a choice vine. He washes his clothes in wine, his robes in the blood of grapes. His eyes are darker than wine, and his teeth are whiter than milk. So who does that sound like to you? Who's tethering his foal to a grapevine, robes dipped in the blood of grapes? What a strange expression, the blood of grapes. His eyes are darker than wine. Again, what a strange expression for Jacob to use of his son Judah. And when we read the messianic prophecies, the, the prophecies that were predicting Jesus' arrival, um, they, 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 some of them are really interesting. So take this one from Isaiah chapter 24. On this mountain, the Lord of heaven's armies will spread a wonderful feast for all the people of the world. It will be a delicious banquet with clear, well-aged wine, and choice meat. There he will remove the cloud of gloom and the shadow of death that hangs over the earth. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away all tears. He'll remove forever all insults and mockery against the land and the people the Lord has spoken. So right from the start of Jesus' ministry, in this first sign in Cana of Galilee, Jesus is at a feast. And actually, he's spreading a feast for the nations. He's turning water into the wine. It can only be described as well-aged wine. And as he's doing so, this is a symbolic act that is saying, I am the Messiah. I am the one who is going to swallow up death forever. He's arrived, the Messiah, and he's going to remove your fear of death, that cloud of gloom, if only you believe in him. Well, there's still one more to go, <laughs> so bear with me. Um, finally, I want to talk of, uh, uh, to draw on this image of wine and the, the symbolism of wine and blood. And this is the scary one because this is where we see in this uh, miracle in Cana of Galilee, Jesus as judge, the new covenant. And, and I thought it would be um, dishonest not to look at some of the judgment um, passages in scripture. So let's look at Isaiah chapter 63, and I hope you'll begin to see how this ties in with the earlier things I've been talking about. Who is this, says Isaiah in chapter 3, who comes from Edom, from the city of Borza, with his clothing stained red? Who is this in royal robes, marching in great strength? It is I, the Lord, announcing your salvation. It is I, the Lord, who has the power to save. Why are your clothes so red, as if you've been treading out grapes? I have been treading the winepress alone. No one was there to help me. In my anger, I have trampled my enemies as if they were grapes. In my fury, I have trampled my foes. Their blood has stained my clothes, for the time has come for me to avenge my people, to ransom them from their oppressors. 
Now that's quite a scary image of wine and blood, isn't it? And there's a different picture in Joel 3. I, the Lord, will sit to pronounce judgment on them. Swing the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come tread the grapes, for the winepress is full. The storage vats are overflowing with the wickedness of these people. So this is Jesus, the judge, treading the winepress. And one last time in Revelation 14. Swing your sickle now to gather the cluster of grapes from the vines of the earth, for they are ripe for judgment. So the angel swung his sickle over the earth and loaded the grapes into the great winepress of God's wrath. The grapes were trampled in the winepress outside the city, and blood flowed from the winepress in a stream about 180 miles long and as high as a horse's bridle. But these are not to be trifled with, these, these images. The winepress is the place of wrath against wickedness. The grapes of wrath, to quote a very famous book title. Jesus as judge will trample in the winepress his enemies, and the blood stained his clothes. But hang on. Whose blood? At the Last Supper, Jesus took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it, and he gave it to them and said, Each of you drink from this, for this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. Someone else's blood has been daubed on our door doorposts so that we might be spared. Wow. Our blood was supposed to stain the clothes of this king, but something extraordinary has happened. For those who repent and believe in him, he, the Lamb of God, has paid our penalty. He's died for us. And as John tells us in the very next chapter, this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only Son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. God sent his Son into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. There's no judgment against anyone who believes in him. But anyone who does not believe in him has already been judged for not believing in God's one and only Son. So that's the story of Cana of Galilee. I mean, I think it's such an amazing story. Um, it's so rich in, in meaning and it draws on so many things from the Old Testament of, yeah, Jesus as, as the groom, the one who's come to marry his church, the vine, the one whom we need to be grafted into. Jesus as the Savior, the Messiah, spreading a feast, the banquet of the Lamb, and then Jesus dying for us to take away God's wrath at wickedness, his own wrath at wickedness, him sacrificing himself. Let's, let's just pause, and I'm sorry if that got a bit heavy, <laughs> and we'll pause for prayer. And perhaps you can pray with me in some way. Lord Jesus, um, we're so sorry that the grapes we produce are so often bitter. And we're so grateful that you have paid for our wickedness with the wine of your very blood. And we're so joyful that you have invited us to a wedding feast and it, that is, it is us, you and we, who are to be married. Help us to remain grafted into you, the true vine, so that we might bless others with wine of celebration. In Jesus' name.